Hello and welcome to the first Spooky Tales podcast presented by me, John. And me, Louise. We have been fascinated by spooky goings on since we can remember and wanted to share with you the stories that pique our interest. Our first story is a tale of mystery, intrigue, hauntings, poltergeist, ancient artefacts, academic reputations and an unexpected twist. It's the spooky tale of the Hexham Heads. Our spooky tale begins in the pleasant Northumbrian market town of Hexham in the Tyne Valley, about a 35-minute drive from Newcastle. On an early summer's day in 1971, Colin Robson, then aged 11, was clearing weeds in the back garden of their semi-detached home of No. 3 Reed Avenue. His nine-year-old brother Leslie was idly watching from an upstairs window. As Colin dug down into the earth, he came across a small, carved stone head. His brother Leslie came out and started to look to see if there was anything else to find. Lo and behold, he found another almost identical stone head in the same area. Both were strangely dense and heavy, and when cleaned, it could be seen that each head had distinctive features. Okay, okay, okay. Small head. How big are we talking? Are we talking... Tangerine, about the size of a tangerine. (laughs) Okay, Tangerine, a big tangerine, I mean, juicy or small, yes. Satsuma, Clementine, no. where, where are we? Well, we're, we're, so we're definitely on the, um, not the big um, baggy Satsuma, it's not, not that sort of size. Yeah. But it's not the sort of um, tight tangerine or Clementines that you get in those sort of bag of 16, um, in those nets in the, uh, in the fruit aisle of your local supermarket. So a small orange? Yeah, a small orange, not as big as a tennis ball, though. Right. Okay, okay, okay. All right, fine. And what colour? What, tangerines? No, not tangerines. I mean, the heads. Oh, we're right. Talking... So the heads were a... Uh, well, one was a sort of normal stone colour. The other was a darker uh, sort of brownish colour. Uh, both made, obviously, stone. They did have some flecks of colour um, on them, though. So, um, you know, some uh, bits of green. And within their eyes, their eyes was almost a sort of... Uh, a yellow crystal type of colour. Really? Yeah. What, painted? No, 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 actual, you know, an actual uh, bit, bit of stone itself. Really? Actually used mm. as the... Oh, right, okay. Okay, yeah. Right. So, and that, actually, just to go along that, so that first head had a skull-like appearance with faint carved lines that gave it a gaunt, bony, vaguely masculine appearance with a Celtic hairstyle. Okay, what's a Celtic hairstyle? Well, it's called slicked back. It's a bit like um, those sort of, you know, the ones with beards. What are they called? <laughs> No. Yeah, you know, they they, uh, they have beard oil. and uh, uh, um, Hipster. Hipster, yeah. So it's kind of like a hipster hairstyle. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what a Celtic hairstyle is. Really? Okay. <laughs> Couldn't tell. <laughs> you you cover that one really well. <laughs> Nobody will notice. But, but judging by the description, it was sort of slicked back. Right, It wasn't okay. ringlets. It wasn't a <laughs> parting. Um, a nice fringe. <laughs> a nice fringe. That's what they need. It was, it was definitely pulled back and in fact oh so not not shaggy hair celtics had had their hair tied back well the the second one was more rounded and had much one was much more expressive features were of an old and formidable woman with a beaked nose and her hair was combed severely backwards into a bun so her hair was a bit more shaggy not uh, so, but I don't no, think. No, not shaggy. It was combed severely backwards. Well, that's what I mean. If you'd taken it, um, taken Oh, you'd I see. So it needed to be. T- yeah, and you frizzed and she'd shaken her head. Like my good self. Yes, it right. would have been a bit more. Yeah, but uh, the but the the uh, the other one, the gaunt, bony, vaguely masculine one. There was there's no there's no man bun on that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> not a trendy, <laughs> not a trendy Celtic head. Well, as I say, sort of hipsterish, but not actually, but no man bun. Right, OK. Uh, the family were fascinated by the heads and they took pride of place inside the Robinsons' new home. OK, so I thought they were called Robsons. 
Oh, did I say Robinsons? Yes. Now, that comes down to some family friends, doesn't it? I've written, I've written that because of that. <laughs> so it's Colin Robson, and yes. then no, it's Robinson. Colin and Leslie Robson. Yeah, so it's not Robinson. I've, mis- I've misput that. Okay. Right. Well, we'll get the names yes. sorted, because names are important they, in this. They really are. Anyways, actually, at this point, there's an intriguing coincidence. Okay. Well, What's that? Not long before he found the Stonehead in the back garden, at his primary school, he took part in a competition and made a clay head of similar size to those found in the back garden. It wasn't a plaster of Paris? No. (laughs) Head? Well, it was, but um, (laughs) it was obviously started with a clay mould and then you put plaster of Paris on top of that. What is plaster of Paris? It's it's plaster and it's probably from Paris. Oh, right, okay. I expect it originated in Paris. I don't think you have to go to Paris to to get it. Gay pay. Blast the, the Bali. Yeah, it's okay. Right. And anyway, so the master said, oh, that's ugly, and it should have a proper neck. Oh. Which is an odd thing to say. I yes. Think. The master. The master of the primary school. Quite a posh primary school. <laughs> the teacher, yes. yes. Got a bit carried away there. Yeah. Um, old sort of school. Old school. Old, old school. The master said, that's ugly. <laughs> should have a proper neck. I need a proper neck. It's Celtic head after all. <laughs> yeah. Let's not go to that. No, no, we didn't know that, obviously. So the next morning, the family awoke to find that the heads had turned to face the direction from where they were discovered. Ooh, okay, that's a bit spooky. Yes, and on subsequent nights, when they moved the head again to different positions, they'd wake up in the morning and find again that the heads had moved. And in one occasion, Leslie's sister had placed it to uh, right to the other end of the bed. Yeah. And in the morning, it had gone all the way down Ooh. to the bottom. It was under the bed, all the way to the bottom under the bed, facing the direction of where Oh, they were just dear me. That's a bit. Yeah, okay. Yes. Oh. Um, in addition to this, there were further strange happenings. Glass was found shattered across a mattress. A mirror was smashed into a frying pan, and glass jumped out of uh, photo frames. Lights, TV turned on and off randomly. And there was the sound of a baby crying in the garden. When there was no baby. Otherwise, that's not that spooky. Yes, well, that, that's right. That, that, yes, and it would be bad parenting if there was just happened to be a, a baby in the Unless in the you, uh, Well, no, unless you're getting it, giving it some fresh air. Well, and it's sleeping outside in the fresh air. Oh, it's a good thing that. <laughs> I'm not sure that's that's strictly true if you're just leaving it sleeping outside in the fresh no, air. No, for a nice bit of fresh air, it should be kept yeah, inside all the wasn't time. Wasn't there, there was, a, there was a woman who said this, and, it, and it was, she had no qualifications whatsoever, did she? Uh, and it was, she just said, yes, yes, but, you know... Put your baby out on the balcony. Well, I think we're going down a road we do not want to go down. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, Talking about me with my childcare. <laughs> exactly, all your qualifications in yeah. childcare. You, we've successfully raised one child <laughs> and three cats. You're right. Let's move on. So the uh, yeah. So a few days after the after the discovery, their next door neighbour Nelly Dodd had a visit in the night. I say, <laughs> lucky Nelly. Well, let's find out if it, if it was lucky or not. So, Some Nelly's great son, names in this. They are Nelly. very excellent. Nelly's sons Brian and Trevor and her daughter Marie, her young, uh, were in their bunk beds, where one accused the other of pulling her, their hair. Ooh. And then Marie began to feel a bit unwell. Oh dear! So to settle them, Nelly got into the bunk bed and started to fall asleep. And when she then then she felt a malevolent presence in the bedroom. Ooh. Then she started to feel something pull at her. Oh, dear. Opening her eyes, she saw what was described as half man, half sheep lurking in the bedroom. Whoa, whoa. We cannot move from that. Well. Half man, half sheep. That's right. It was lurking in the bedroom and then started to come at her on all fours. What, the half, what? The half man, half sheep. And it brushed her leg as it went past and then took off bounding down the stairs before disappearing out the front door. Half man, half sheep. That's right. Nelly screamed for her husband as soon as it had gone past her. And although he came straight away and he went the same way that the half man, half sheep did, he did not see it. You, you don't seem to be responding to the half man, half sheep. Yes, that's right. It was a body of a man and the head of a sheep. Oh! A were sheep. Oh, a were sheep. Oh, that's so weird. That is so weird. Well, in fact, it, oh, 
Are you sure it was? Well, it was also said to have been the body of a, a sheep and the head of a man. I'm not, oh, well, I'm no, not sure which is weirder, to be honest. I think it's the first one. No. The head of a sheep. Okay. No, surely it's the body it's of a, a bit, sheep. Probably a bit more aggressive if it was a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the body of a sheep and a man going, hello? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nelly? Ooh. The sheep. Oh, see, Ooh, that, is worse, that, is, that, is that is worse, isn't it? That is worse. Yes. No, oh, my sure God. A were sheep. I've never heard of a were sheep. There is a film called The Black Sheep, and uh, that's a horror film. I think it's a comedy horror film because it's about were sheep um, and about these sheep. Mm. I think they come from outer space, or could be getting that mixed up with Llamageddon. <laughs> Llamageddon? Yes. <laughs> But anyway, they are basically turn. Because I like knitting. Both they, of those they, sound great. <laughs> that's right. Well, they bite. They bite people, and they t- the they sheep get, or the, well, the sheep do. The sheep right. get they're nasty. They t- oh yes, they they um, um rogue sheep. This yeah, this uh, person sort of rearing sheep, um, which genetically experimenting on them, and bad. they started to they turned bad. 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 <laughs> Very good. And they uh, had be- to repeat it. Didn't yes, they pick up on it. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and then they bit people who then turned into Ooh. their sheep. Ooh, they yes. were bad sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you there. What's the time with the bad yeah. sheep? Yeah. But it's and not what, was the, what was the other one? The llama drama? The, no, llama geddon. Llama drama. Did you get that? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not as mad as it sounds, though, because... Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> can, I just, can, we just, can we just agree? It is actually as mad what, as it sounds. What, having sheep run through your house? Yeah, okay, oh! fair enough. <laughs> oh! That's giving me the shivers. Oh, that really has. Chased by the llama, uh, the, the, the llamas llama. from space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> well, you see that across the road was an abattoir, and that had been said to have been haunted by ghostly sheep beasts. Sheep beasts. Yes. So which I don't want to live on that road. Could be a were sheep, couldn't it? That sounds like a were sheep, a sheep beast. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, so it is weird. You're right, but there is, you know, some sort of precedence for it. Right. I would want to move away from that road, I'm thinking, opposite an abattoir, with sheep beasts. Yes, well... It's have, not in the desirable area, it's, is it's it? It's funny you should say that, but because actually they did move away very shortly after that. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> really don't yeah, believe or, or, that. However, although the reports said, yes, it was because they could no longer live, uh, no longer live there due to the were sheep And the sheep beasts. Yeah, and the sheep beasts. The daughter years later said that a major factor was actually that the house was too small for, for the eight of them. The eight of them. That's right, and the council agreed. Yes. So as soon as there was another more spacious house became available, they were off. What happened next with the heads? Well, the Robson family from 3 Reed Avenue took the heads to the Hexham Abbey where they gave them to the verger. Well, he hadn't a clue what to do with them, so he gave them to one of his uh, one of the guides at the Hexham Abbey, a lady called Betty Gibson. Good now, she name. was a yeah, indeed. Well, she was a keen archaeology student studying at a night class with Professor Richard Bailey. Now, he took a look and thought that they were probably Celtic. So is that the first time that they've been looked at by anybody? Or someone who knew roughly what they were uh, talking about, yes. Okay. So Betty had had them in the, her house for two weeks, sat on the dresser, and nothing had happened. Nothing spooky, nada. Nada, right. Yes, not a were-sheep in sight. <laughs> or a sheep beast. <laughs> or a sheep beast, that's right. So later they were paid a visit by someone from the Newcastle Museum of Antiquities. Newcastle, north of England. The, the person from the Newcastle Museum of Antiquities confirmed them to be Celtic, probably from around the year 200 BC. Right. So Celtic, they mean from the British and from the British Isles. North so European. North yeah. European, Okay. Um, but North European at around that time, around the what was it? Was it about Iron Age or Stone Age? No, no, Big no, stone that. heads. Well, no, 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 no. It wasn't. It wasn't Stone Age. It was. It was way past that. Was it? Yeah, much more about Iron Age. I think the you'll bronze. find the Bronze Age. It could be the Bronze Age, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so the Celts. So it was a had, metal age. It was a metal age. It was a metal it was an age. age of metal. Yeah. That's right, yes. Okay. So the Celts they had a head cult where they carved stone heads and had them placed on pillars in their shrines. Okay. So the man from the museum said that similar sightings of a half man, half beast had been made in Germany. What? Yeah, and so the and the locals would no longer go to those areas where the, the beast had been seen for fear of seeing the beast. So, so this is not unprecedented. So, the, so this is kind of, the, there's a connection with other heads 
and half man, half beast. Well, yes. In, in this particular instance, it's heads in Germany. Heads in Germany, right. Yes. Okay. Gosh. So did the museum then take the heads in or did our Betty hold on to them? Well, it was um, actually now we enter the respected archaeologist, Dr. Anne Ross of Southampton University. Right. Now, Dr. Ross was a Celtic linguist and archaeologist. Ooh. Now, she often carried out research work on behalf of museums, and it was in this capacity that she was asked to examine the two heads. So, Southampton, south of England. So, would you be kind enough to read out her initial reaction to the Hexham heads after the first few days that she uh, they were in her possession? Yes, of course. <clears throat> Though there was nothing unpleasant about the appearance of the heads, I took an immediate instinctive dislike to them. I left them in the box they had been sent in and put it in my study. I planned to have them geologically analysed and then return them as soon as possible to the north. A night or two after they had arrived, I woke up suddenly at around 2am, deeply frightened and very cold. I looked towards the door and by the corridor light glimmered a tall figure slipping out of the room. My impression was that the figure was dark like a shadow and it was part animal, part man. I felt compelled to follow it as if by some irresistible force. I heard it, whatever it was, going downstairs and then I saw it again, moving along the corridor that leads to the kitchen. But now I was too terrified to go on. Yes, Dr Ross, she woke her husband who searched the house but found absolutely nothing. How so? It's another part animal, part man. Another part animal, part man, and another bloke who couldn't uh, couldn't see it. Boy looking. Yes, it's what we it's what we're going to. I think so. Did you being from a bloke? That? It's it's, uh, it's the looking all over and can't see. <laughs> yes. Did you see that half man, half beast? What half man, half beast? <laughs> yes, that's right. I heard <laughs> you screaming. Came came along. Yeah, yeah, what's looking at the off. ceiling? So <laughs> that's right. how many half man, half beasts are up there? <laughs> So, Dr. Ross thought she must have had a nightmare. Don't blame her. But could not believe that it could have been so real. They decided to say nothing about it. Who would blame them? Oh, well, exactly. However, the disturbing events of a few days later was to challenge the reality of her nightmare. Okay. Their teenage daughter came home to an empty house after school about 4pm. It was a couple of hours before Dr Ross and her husband were due to return from London. And when they arrived home, they found their daughter in a state of shock. So much so, she would not say what had happened. But also she was a teenager. So wouldn't respond to them. That's true. That's perhaps... <laughs> but, but I think even in this extreme circumstance, it was extreme. OK, right. So eventually, they did wheel it out of her what had happened. Their daughter had also witnessed the werewolf. Ooh! Yeah. We've moved to a werewolf. Well, absolutely. So their daughter had opened the door and there in front of her on the stairs was a tall, part beast, dark and inhuman. Oh, dear me! It bolted towards her, vaulted over the banisters and landed in the corridor with a soft thud. A soft thud? Yes. It made her feel uh, and think that its feet were padded like an animal. Oh, my word. So this is daylight. This yeah. is like 4... 4 p.m. So it could have been winter, in which case it was obviously maybe getting dark. The werewolf figure then ran towards her room and although absolutely terrified... She felt compelled to follow the creature. What? No! Yeah, like her mum. Run the opposite direction? Well, you'd think. So, but at the door, it vanished. Oh my God, I can't believe that she actually was com felt compelled to follow it, just like her mother did. Yeah, that's right. And that she, ha her mum hadn't told her. No. Dr Ross hadn't said but over the breakfast, you'll never oh. guess what awful dream I had. That's right. They decided to say nothing. Oh! <gasps> Oh, my word. So, obviously, the parents were a bit kind of freaked as well. That the, yeah. you know, their, daughter, their daughter had seen this as well. So, I think what was interesting also was on several occasions after this sighting, the family heard the sound of something vaulting over the banisters and landing with a soft thud. Oh, my good on, Lord. So, on, what, they'll be sat on the sofa? Yeah, and watching telly or whatever. Quietly. Or, yeah, reading Celtic books. <laughs> reading Celtic histories. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to have discussions about. Yeah, and on, yeah. on one occasion, the mother and daughter thought they saw a dark figure before they heard the now familiar vault and thud. Oh my lord, I don't think I could cope with a 
a familiar vault and thud. No, well, it was yes, indeed. So you would want yes, it would yes. make your but make your hackles go up, wouldn't it? Could it be suggestion because they'd heard about what had happened when the heads were discovered up north? So they kind of they heard half half man, half beast, and thought werewolf. Well, I wondered that, but the funny thing is, Doctor Ross didn't know about any of that until after their own terrifying events. Oh my word. So it's completely that she had they had nothing before. They had no idea that this had happened. None at all. Did anyone else experience similar events to the Ross family? And the, the other families from the north, well, Mead not, Avenue. Well, not everyone. Um, as we heard earlier, nothing happened to Betty, the archaeology student, and she'd looked after the heads before Dr Ross had had them. Oh, uh, right, yes. Also, a colleague of Dr Ross, Professor Hodson, he'd had them in his possession at Southampton University for a couple of years, and there wasn't even a weremouse. No, not even a wear, not a wear, ma- <laughs> wear mouse. Yes, nothing oh, at all. Little down. tiny, little <gasps> tiny. Well, so half man, half mouse. Yes, but it'd be quite small. It'd only be a couple of inches high. No, but if it's half man, it'd just have a really small head. Yeah. <gasps> oh, mm. oh, what's worse? Oh, that'd be freaky because it would just look like a headless man. Oh, my word, but they could squeak. <laughs> or he would have an enormous mouse head with oh, big ears. Oh, no, that would be scary. Mickey Mouse. Oh, 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 oh gosh. No, now you, I won't be able to look at he's Mickey Mouse in the season. He's a werewolf. Well. Yes. Oh, dear. Let's not tell, no. tell our son about that. No, no, <laughs> let's not do that. So, uh, yeah, so um, Professor Hodson, so this guy that, that we didn't didn't see any wear mice. So he had. So he was at Southampton University yeah, he was, with he was Dr. A, Ross. That's right. And he he was an archaeology professor and he had had them for two years. And he actually then lent them to a guy called Dr. Don Robbins. Now, Dr. Robbins was also an archaeologist okay, at the... Okay, so hold a second. Dr. Ross is the lady who had them yep. vaulting mm-hmm. soft thud. Yeah. Her colleague, Professor Hodson... Yeah. ...then gave them to Dr. Robbins. That's correct. Right, okay. Now, Dr. Robbins was an archaeologist at the University of London. And he also held a PhD in solid-state chemistry. I don't know what that is. Well, it's chemistry of solid states. Right, OK. Yes. That's good. Well, that's cleared so that I'm assume, up. I'm assuming it's not liquids. No. no. <laughs> or, or vapors. Gases. Yeah. gases, gaseous, it's gaseous just things substances. That, just things that are basically like stone. Right, yeah. OK. I don't know. It, uh, that, that would be what it, was, it would suggest to me. But yes, um, I agree with I you. mean, I've read the book, but I still don't know. No. <laughs> yeah, his interest was um, both of the scientific and Earth Mysteries variety. You may have heard of the Dra- Dragon Project? No. Okay. Well, it was about um, it was less about dragons and more about investigating the unusual properties and energies attributed to ancient sites. For instance, stone circles like Stonehenge. Okay, well, I'm, I'm less interested because it's not about dragons, mm-hmm. firstly. That yeah. was a bit of a letdown. Yeah. But... Ancient, unusual properties and energies. You mean kind of weird energies yeah. or so, what yeah, kind of... Yeah, people will often go to these sites because and experience, you know, the, the vibe and groovy vibes, man. Right. So these are ancient ruins. So they're kind of Stone Age and all the stone circles that we have yeah. across the world, aren't uh, they? I mean, absolutely. Sort of um, but particularly, I guess, in, again, Northern Europe, yeah. there, um, there's a st- Stonehenge in the south in Wiltshire and Avebury, which is nearby, another massive stone circle. There's all the Cornish sites. There, there, is, there are Cornish um, uh, sites of stones and, and uh, sort of, sort of um, you, you know, areas of ancient interest there. And, of course, in Scotland. Oh, there are lots all in across Scotland, the, the aren't they? Rollwright stones. With the Rollwright stones, yes, that's yeah, another that's another one true. as well. Yeah. And people have often said there are, you know, particular energies there. So this project, part of it was to actually sort of see if there was any scientific fact, scientific fact behind people experiencing these energies there. Right, I see. And there wasn't any. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a letdown there. Well, yes, but what might have had some foundation, in fact, was that um, the magnetic and radiation anomalies from the sites, there was something there. So they were similar. So they so they, they looked at both the radiation of all these sites, like yeah. magnetic resonance and that kind of thing. That's right, yeah. and also okay. possible infrared and ultrasonic effects too. Ooh. So in particular... Megalithic sites have an unusual, an unusually higher occurrence of a light phenomena such as earth lights. Okay, so megalithic. Y- yes. What are megalithic? Well, it's even bigger than 
big lithic. Right. It's mega lithic. <laughs> so I think so, I think it's I think it's I've never heard of big lithic. Yeah, well, I think so it's there's a big lithic site. That's right. And I think it's basically big stones. Right. Okay. Is, is what mega lithic is. And so you okay. can get small lithic um, lithics, but you know, you basically they just hurt your feet if you're going on barefoot <laughs> and suddenly beaches. tread on one. Yes, yes okay. Um, right, I see. And then earth damn, lights. That t- tiny lithic thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. I'm gonna call them lithics from now on. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, anyway, but there was this thing about No earth lights. What are earth lights? So earth lights um are we they're also known as will o' the wisps and you can get them with earthquakes uh, they're often seen just before earthquakes where in the in the sky that there, there will be these multicolored lights floating about and then a few days later there'll be a, a, an earthquake oh right i see so they can be a precursor to earthquakes but these aren't the what they're talking about at megalithic sites are not precursors to earthquakes they're just talking about light phenomena yes that's correct there yeah. is something that is seen yes that you see us. But how, why is it associated to the Earth? Well, Earth light. Um, this is something Dr. Robbins talks about when he says there's something called, uh, what was it called? Something like tro- trobothermulescence, um, uh, which is, now I, now I haven't made that up. I think I've just mis- <laughs> mispronounced it. <laughs> Could you tell by my <laughs> that I was going, yes. can um, you made that up? But it's something all about trobothermulescence, which is uh, basically when the... Um, heat and the energy of the stone can get released oh. um, in, the, in the form of light. A light um, fart. Yeah, that's, I've not thought about that. I mean, that's you know that probably says it better than uh, the, the, the long word I was trying to pronounce. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the project then went on to investigate the interaction between ancient sites and human consciousness. Right. So yes, I'll just go on to explain. So this was done by inviting people to sleep in these selected ancient sites, and then waking them up when they were in REM sleep. So that's, you know, the bit where you're starting to dream. You're, you're right, it's flickers, fluttering. Yeah. It's about every 90 minutes. God, that's just when you don't want to be woken up, isn't it? Well, when yes. You're, you're really groggy. So they had a volunteer who had to stay awake. And then when he saw their eyes going, prod them. Oh. And with a tape recorder, they'd have to tell the volunteer what they, what it was that they were dreaming about. Oh, nightmare. So what they were hoping to find was any, was some connection between the site... And the dreams, including any physical attributes. So, for example, if it had already been recorded uh, that the sites that had high and sort of amounts of background radiation had, had triggered, uh, had been able to trigger vivid hallucinations in some subjects. So they were looking for any effects, such as a memory field, in magico-religious sites that might also be picked up by the dreaming mind. Now, and you're giving me that look again. So it's for... Right, it's- let's slow... So we're going to have to... D- does this have anything to do... With the heads. Yes, uh, because they're... they're oh, well, yes, it does. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, that was my first question, because I did get lost, a little bit lost. It, it so, does, because if you... If we, so people are asleep, and what they're thinking is the earth or the stones? Well, uh, the sites itself, they, they were imbued with this kind of ritual ancient energy energy that's right. right and so if you imagine you know for example you go into a church and there's a real sense of calm and worship there isn't there if you go into an old cathedral or an old church right and, and it's almost as if that reverence has been built into the stone I and see. reflected into the stone so if you, if you sort of take that concept and sort of take it to these ancient sites where they people obviously built these things for some reason and then did you know sort of pro- probably did rituals at these sites and so is there any memory left in at these sites? So why were they doing the sleep? Was that that they were thinking that... was the, that the dream, that they would be able to connect to it. Oh, right. And what to, to see the if the memory there's... of the... In, in the built oh, into the I site see. itself. And so it, would it be that if there were lots of people having a similar dream, they would say, well... It yeah. was something to do with the site. That's right. And if they got similar... There were lots of people dreaming that it was cold and wet. <laughs> That's right. But if they were dreaming of certain symbols or certain types of things happening there even... So that the dream was kind of imbued in the area. Yes. I see. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that was a much better way of, of, of saying it, actually. That's uh, rather than this magico-religious uh, thing that I yes. came up with. No, that's Anyway, um, so I, I do digress here. Um, but it, we, we shall return to this because we shall return to this because there is a, a relationship here with with the stone heads themselves. Now, one of the main organisers of the project was this chap called Paul Devereaux. And, but Don Robbins was also involved for, in the Dragon Project for a time. And he took some of these ideas and then went on to create a book called The Language of Stone. And, and we'll come to that a, a bit later. So Don Robbins, he took an instant wariness 
to one of the heads, and that was the uh, the hag head, so the one with the hair scraped back into a bun. Right. And the, and the sort of beaked nose. Isn't that weird? Because I always think hag, I think scraggy hair. Mm-hmm. Like, ah! Yeah. I'm doing a hag That's impression. That's a very good, yeah. very good impression, yes. <laughs> Although I'm young and beautiful and so therefore look nothing like a hag. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, but he felt uh, that that particular head, it made him feel very uneasy. Yeah. Um, so he takes them back to his home in London and places them in various places. He doesn't really know what to do with them. He puts them at the end of the garden. He puts them in the garden shed. And eventually he actually places them in his a study. Right. Now... Nothing's actually happened at this point apart from him feeling uneasy about uh, the hag head. So he ha- nothing's they've not moved. He hasn't seen a, a were she. Nope, nothing like that at all. Sheep beast, were mouse, nothing. No, no just a sense of unease. Okay. Right. So one day he makes a bold move, and just Ooh. before he goes out to return a book back to the library, I say he's a one, isn't he? That's right. Yes. Well, he wanted to make sure you know no fee, no fees, no late yes. fa- late fees, late fees. So he dares the heads. To show him what show him what they could do when he returns. Wow! Yes, that was bold. It was. So he sets off, and he was wondering, "What well, you know? What have I done?" Yeah. Um, so he sets off, and then not long down the street, he realizes he's actually forgotten the library book that's oh, meant to be taken back. No. Oh, oh, we've all nightmare. done that. Yeah. We've all done that. So he has to go back, otherwise his trip's useless. Yes, there's the nothing book. worse than getting to the library and, and where's the library book? Oh dearie me! Where's the library book? Where's it? Is it on the boat? It was it in the study. <gasps> yeah. With the heads. With the heads. That he's just goaded. Yes, that's correct. So he has to go back now. So now an old Edwardian residence. So it's the about a late 1800s, a late 19th century, hundreds, isn't it? Like yeah, 1800s. 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. Um, so, and he, um, and the house is normally quite drafty. The windows, uh, you know, they've got gaps in them and so on. Yeah. It's a blustery day. So before he'd left, there was sort of, the curtains were moving a bit because of the wind oh, right, and, yeah. and uh, and it was all a little drafty. So when he goes in, yes, none of that. No, no. Uh, all he has, or all he can feel, is just an electric, tingling silence. Ooh. And as he went up the stairs to the study, yes, the atmosphere became denser and denser and more menacing. Yeah, and it seemed to be emanating from the hag head. He didn't like the hag. He really didn't. <laughs> Anyway, he grabbed the books and swiftly left. Yes. And upon his return later that day, yes, the atmosphere had returned to normal. The wind, the the the, the um, the windows were rattling away. <laughs> That's right, yes. uh, and you this saw- is just him having a just really freaking himself out, isn't it? He's I, just having a moment there. I think so, probably. Yes, he, he was obviously pretty susceptible to that. A bit like myself, really. You know, when, if I can, I can get freaked out by walking down the stairs and going downstairs in the middle of the night. Yes. I, I do that. So I think he was, I think he'd got himself into that sort of state. Yes. He needed um, a nice biscuit to calm himself down. Yeah. Well, I certainly, that, that's what I do. I have several biscuits. <laughs> One should do the trick. It should, well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But um, you, there's no, you need more to help with the glass of milk. You, uh, oh, so, right. Yes, okay. Yeah. Anyway, another person was affected. Who was affected by the heads was Priscilla the Cleaner. Priscilla the Cleaner, yes. not so, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, or no, whatever that film was no. So yes, it was actually her job title as opposed to well, being a cleaner what, was what, Queen she of the Desert. <laughs> 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 wow. So she wasn't sort of called Priscilla the Cleaner, as in sort of, God, that, was, that was her, you know, her... her uh, she was a cleaner. Her name given. Yes. Uh, that she was a cleaner called Priscilla. Domestic, what's they called now? Oh. Domestic technicians? Yes. yes. Okay. So she came into contact with the heads while they were being kept at Southampton University. Okay. Now, when Priscilla was cleaning in the room where they were kept, she had the distinct impression that she was being watched even though she knew there was nobody there in the building. It's like those creepy photos, isn't it? That the eyes yes. seem to follow you. Well, in fact, it's said that um, the hag head had a similar thing. If it's placed in a certain position, the, the eyes would follow. As though they were looking at you. Yes, Ooh. that's right. And that, that, that was Dr. Um, that Dr. was Ross. Dr. Robbins, actually, you know, the guy. He, no, it's no wonder Dr. Freaked. Robbins? Yes, Dr. Don Robbins. Oh, Don Robbins. The guy Robbins. we were just talking I'm about. Sorry, I had Dr. Out. Ross in my head. Yeah, no, it's easily done. Um, so when she cleaned the cabinet in which the heads were kept, this is Priscilla the cleaner, yeah. she could. She felt cold and shivery and uneasy 
and rushed to finish the cleaning so she could get home. And this, this was Well, it wasn't like her to feel this way at all. And on the way home in the car, she could not shake the feeling of the heaviness and that her thoughts were not her own. Ooh. And later that night, she fell asleep in the armchair. She was tired. She was tired and her, and her husband and daughter, in fact, they'd already gone to bed. No, oh, nice. Just obviously left her in the armchair. Yeah. Yeah. So but when she woke, she was woken by a cry from her daughter. Ooh. And there in front of her was a huge werewolf standing Ooh. on two legs, staring at her with its cold, dead, yellow eyes. Oh, my word. Her daughter had seen the creature also. Really? And she'd cried out in terror. And that's yes. what um, woke her up. So the, the beast then took off, jumped through an open window, landing with a soft thud in the back garden. A soft thud again. Vanishing into the night. Oh, my word. The family, believe it or not, moved house soon after. God, I'm not surprised. Yes, perturbed by what they'd seen. Oh, did so, they declare that on the uh, on the survey? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. I, I, I wonder, Priscilla. I, I expect so, yes. yes. You, you have to do these things these days. Uh, so in answer to your question, which was, uh, did other people see so, spooky stuff? Oh, yes, I'd forgotten um, I'd yes, asked. So well, I, thank I, you. I, I had meandered a bit. Um, <laughs> yes, some did and some didn't. Right. Okay, let's recap. So the heads were discovered by two young boys, mm-hmm. Colin and Leslie, yeah. in the back garden of Three Reed Avenue in 1971, That's up right. north. Yeah, that was a sort of um, late May, early June. Right, okay. Ooh, nice weather. They and the next door neighbours were experiencing spooky goings on, including the sighting of a were sheep in the house. Yeah. The heads were deemed to be Celtic in origin from about 200 BC. Yes, that's right. And it was thought, actually, that the back garden may have been a Celtic shrine at some point in the past. Why was that? Did they find other things? No. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Well, when they sold the house, <laughs> on their survey, it said, and Celtic shrine. shrine. And amphitheatre. But amphitheater. well, they hadn't found anything to support that evidence either. <laughs> All right, okay. Okay. Right, so Dr. Robbins, no, Dr. Ross, Dr. Ross is asked to have a look at them, and she, her family, and a cleaner at the university. Priscilla, yeah. Priscilla, plus Dr. Robbins. The other archaeologist. Right, also experienced strange goings on, although Dr. Robbins was a bit thin, his experience, (laughs) not wanting to be a bit judgy, but I'm sorry. He gave himself a right fright. But anyway, but this time it was with a werewolf, not a were-sheep. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I think they're both quite frightening. They are. I, I, well, yes, you. I, I don't know. If you had to flip a coin as to which one you'd have, probably have the were-sheep over the werewolf. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, if I had to make that choice. If you had to, <laughs> it's a tricky one. I wouldn't it? want to be in that, that situation, yeah. to be honest. So, yeah, the thing is... Yes. It was then that something really strange happened. Right? What? I can't believe anything stranger could have happened. Stranger than a were sheep. Well, a certain... we are really reaching. <laughs> but okay. But a certain Desmond Craigie from Hexham, right. who was a lorry driver at the time, claimed that he had made them as toys for his daughter in the 1950s when he and his family lived at Number Three Reed Avenue. But what? That's right. What? So Desmond Craigie said he had made them from a local sta- um, stone, sand and water from where he had worked at the time. He was in a builder's merchants. All that stone and sand. Yes. And water. And water. So to quote him. Okay. I simply scooped up two handfuls of the stuff as if I was making a snowball. I moulded the mixture into two balls with a knife. I carved eyes, ears, a nose and a mouth. And then I shaped rough necks so that the finished heads could stand up on a shelf. It only took a few minutes. Oh, my word. So they're not 200, not from 200 BC. No, that's right. Now, would you be kind enough to read Dr. Ross's reply attempting to save her reputation? Yes. Okay. Mr. Craigie's claim is an interesting story and I will have to investigate. Unless Mr. Craigie was familiar with genuine Celtic stone heads, it would be extraordinary for him to make it like this. They are not crude by any means. Indeed, Dr. Ross challenged Mr. Craigie to repeat the feat, a challenge which he took up. However, the result was not entirely convincing. So, in football scores, that could be one all. (laughs) Okay. 
But not just football, could be hockey. It could be hockey. Well, yes. it could be numerous things. Like Indeed. So the initial analysis of the heads, because I, I, Dr. Ross, when she had them, she got an initial analysis done uh, of the heads themselves, a sort of geophysical analysis. Well, she did say she was going to, didn't she? Yes. And it confirmed that the heads were probably ancient. Right. So uh, older than 1950. Yes, very much so. Being. being ancient, you know, way back then. But then wouldn't it, how could they say how old stone is? Because if he used local stone, sand and water, why would that say, why would that show an age at all, really? Surely. Well, it would be in a, it'd be the composition and the, and um, so it'd be actually the, the sort of more of the composition of the stones, of the stone heads themselves, as opposed to sort of, you know, physically dating the heads by, you know, you can't do obviously radiocarbon dating or anything like that. And, and didn't you say they had like other stones and bits of things in them as well, like the yellow eyes and stuff? Yes, but it's, um, so that that must be, that'd be one way of the, the way they would look at that. Obviously, another way of for stone to date stone is finding things in context around with them, but they they didn't have that. Right, So it would be more on a sort of a compositional analysis. Okay. Um, so that was 2-1 to Dr. Ross. Yeah. However, a second, more thorough analysis of the heads said the opposite. Ooh. So two all. So they then followed the usual criticism of the testing methods and of both tests. I think you're being harsh by saying two all. I think it's more three two to Dr. To Craigie. Really, to Craigie. Could, it, well, in fact, Dr. Ross did say that she might well have made a mistake. Ooh. But she also then went on to say that it did not take away the fact that the heads were extremely evil. Oh, gosh, that's a bit of a parting comment, wasn't well, it? Well, yes, and then things started to dine up down a bit after that. Well, and yeah. as we spoke um, earlier, Don Robbins, Dr Don Robbins, the archaeologist and solid-state chemist, chemist yes. um, he had borrowed the heads from Dr Hodson from Southampton University. Right. But because of the experiences he was having and, it, and the fact that he was a bit nesh, uh, he was keen to get rid of them. <laughs> right, this Don Robbins is a bit nesh. That's yes. right. By nesh, you mean... Easily frightened and wound himself <laughs> up into a tremendous state. Yes, about right. very much my, myself. Right? Yes. yes. Um, so enter the astrologer, Frank Hyde. Astrologer, not astronomer. So this is the guy who does stars, star charts. Okay. I've never heard of him. Is he well known? No. Oh, right. um, um, Well, he is in this context, but uh, he's, he does not like he's in the Daily Mail. He wasn't in the paper. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. He heard Mr. Robbins was looking to offload the heads and what in the pub? <laughs> he, was, he was bemoaning <laughs> over a pie. Oh, well, I've got these heads. Right, I well, want to I get know, rid of. I know someone who wants to get rid of two Kelty heads. If you're interested, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. So he'd heard about it and offered his services. So that, uh, anyways, so Don Robbins was keen yes. to get rid of them. So yeah. he took them over to Frank's home, right. which was on the other side of London, and was uh, very pleased to leave them with him after Frank had performed one or two dowsing experiments. Dowsing. Now, dowsing is... Um, now, Frank had done two different sort of dowsing experiments. One was... Dowsing? A, what is dowsing? Well, I'm just about to explain. Okay. So, one was with a pendulum. Dowsing? Sorry, I just keep saying so you, that you put it. So, you have a, a pendulum. Uh, it, it can be so a bit of string with a sort of... either. Normally, they do it with a sort of crystal or something yeah. like that. And wave it about over the, the object. Right. Uh, or it moves. I don't think they meant to wave about. I think it, I think it meant waves about... On its own. Right. Oh, I see. So the object causes it to move. Something like that. Okay. The other one is that you get two angled metal rods. Well, actually, they don't have to be metal. Um, but, uh, two rods. Yeah. Okay. Angled. And they, uh, again, move upon on their own when you, you sort of have... A, people use dowsing to find perhaps... Uh, something in the ground or a water, water source. Yeah. yeah. So you hold so them and they, they... hold them sort of parallel. And then as you're walking along, you're thinking, you know, tell me where water is, where's the water, where's the water? And when it comes across some water in the ground, they cross. Oh, I see. So and they cross on their own, obviously. You're not... You just go, yeah. whoop, here we Here are. we go. Yeah. Here's a tab. That's right. And you dig down <laughs> and hopefully you find some water. Right, I see. So now, he'd pro- now Frank had promised that he'd be in touch to let Don Robbins know of his results and findings. Right. Okay. So what were the findings? Well, Frank Hyde and the Hexham Heads were never heard from again. What? That's right. Seriously? It just vanished. It was rumoured that he'd been in a terrible car accident not long after, but no one knows where they are to this day. Do you know, I did not see that one coming. That's right. I know. It's a, It's just another, it. another part of this spooky tale. 
And so where are they now? We don't know. Nobody knows. I say we don't know. Yeah, <laughs> That's well, right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The royal we of those. Uh, uh, yeah, so nobody knows. They're just gone. And Frank oh. with it. So, you know, was it to do with the heads or was it just one of those things? He just, you know, oh. is living in a caravan in a field somewhere. Who Didn't knows? The sheep just finally got their man. Could be. This going back to this sort of language of stone thing. It was. It was. Um, what language of stone? Well, this was Don Robbins, who, who you know, the, the Nesh guy, who uh, he. Um, well, I say he's Nesh. I'm feeling feeling terrible now. He's yeah. probably uh, you know strong, constitutionally yeah. brave man, much you know much braver than I could be. Anyway, but uh, he was. Um, he'd written this. He wrote this book called The Language of Stone. Uh, and as I say, he was part of the Dragon Project for a while, where they were looking to find if there were sort of memories that people would pick up in, in uh, when they were dreaming, if they were sleeping in these sites. Yeah. And he then sort of built upon a theory that had uh, been started to go around, which was called the stone tape theory. Yeah. Whereby uh, the the stone could almost record events and then play them back at a later date under certain conditions. And he goes into, in the book, he goes into the sort of chemistry of it, being a solid-state chemist, he goes into the chemistry of how this might happen. Right, so can you link the book or something so that people can Absolutely. have a look at this? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, there- it's also linked the uh, book that goes into a great deal of detail about the Hexham Heads by Paul Screeton. Absolutely brilliant book. He's a, a really thorough, detailed journalist leaves no stone unturned and it's a really interesting book to read so um yeah so thanks to to those people for that and also there's a a very good youtube on uh, priscilla the cleaner so i'll link that in as well as a lady called allison who produced that okay. and, pre- and give that story so that's the stone tape theory is well perhaps this werewolf um uh. perhaps, perhaps on these were beasts where um uh, maybe. So they're saying like kind of a heightened, like, you know, they say with ghosts that a, a heightened experience happened yeah. and it leaves a kind of a recording of the moment. That's why you get so many people that have passed away in some way. So in a, in a more extreme way, you see them. Wandering. Yes. And I think in this case, it perhaps was extreme. Uh, yeah, with and, sheep, that is it. I mean, what's yeah. more extreme than that? But and, but if it was ancient, you could understand that. You you, you know maybe there were some rituals and some um, spirit summonings of <gasps> were beasts and, and what have you. What did Craigie do? Well, if they were modern, yes. What happened there? How did yeah. that happen? Where, how did that get it mixed up? Uh, if it if indeed it has that theory. Yeah. Um, the, the most famous stone tape theory you know example is uh in york in the north of england where in the um cellars a chap was in the cellar and then and saw a roman legion march past him wow um, but well, uh, york but is a roman was known for having a roman, roman garrison, garrison that's wasn't right. it so, yeah. but they and were they cut off from the knee <gasps> um, but they just marched through the wall as well Oh, my word. Um, but then it was found that the Roman road was actually about 18 inches below where the actual floor of the cellar was. So they would have been walking on the road. That's hence why they couldn't see the... Uh, and the Roman road was there? Yes. I couldn't see their sandals. Their Roman sandals. Couldn't see the... the, the, the that's right. Their Roman footwear. Yeah. <gasps> oh, my so, word. So that's the stone tape theory. That's the that's idea, the, is that the stones... But that's not yeah. an extreme experience well I don't no. know I and know of course the, the downfall to it is of course you know wouldn't we be seeing ghosts everywhere I mean yeah. there's a lot of stone about yes anyway that is true well there we go that was our first episode of the Spooky Tales podcast fantastic I really enjoyed it and we would love to hear from you if you have any comments also if you've got any of your own Spooky Tales please do let us know how can they contact us? You can email us at the Spooky Tales Podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. So that's the Spooky Tales Podcast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Instagram as the Spooky Tales Podcast. It's well worth checking out. Absolutely, because we've got some pictures of the Hexham heads that you can see for yourselves, as well as one of Desmond Craigie holding up his replica heads. Ooh, it's well worth looking up. Indeed. So there we go. Until next time, when we will have another spooky tale. Bye. Bye.